Hi, I want to welcome and thank all of you for joining us. My name is Samantha Heap, and I'm one of Hesperian's board members and its treasurer. I am so excited for today's program, where we will be honoring Hesperian's 50th anniversary, as well as the long friendship and partnership between Hesperian and the Peace Corps. For our program today, we're going to hear first from Hesperian's Executive Director, Sarah Shannon, on how Hesperian initially be began working with the Peace Corps. Then we'll hear from a number of RPCVs on how they've used Hesperian materials over the years, as well as a little bit about the process of working with partners to translate materials into local languages and adapt them to local contexts. Near the end, we'll talk about different ways you can support Hesperian in its continued work. Um, so I think the first thing we wanted to do actually was start with a quick poll to see where everyone is calling in from today. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of West Coast representation. We've got Portland, Oakland, Berkeley, uh, Seattle, but also, oh, Albany, but also uh, West Coast, I mean, sorry, East Coast, Philadelphia, um, Portland, Maine, let's see, Cockeysville, Maryland, and U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Rockville, Maryland, let's see where else, and of course, Brussels, Lee, <laughs> Charlottesville, um, wow, Okay, great. A really broad representation. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you all for calling in, especially those of for those of you who um, it's later in the day. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us here today. I'm now going to hand it off to Sarah, who's going to speak a little bit about Hesperian and the Peace Corps' long history together. Thanks, Samantha. And it's really wonderful to see so many of you and see your names popping up on the screen. I'm so, so pleased that you can join us for this celebration. As Samantha said, we're celebrating 50 years of Where There Is No Doctor and 50 years of Peace Corps volunteers using Where There Is No Doctor and other Hesperian books to take care of themselves, to respond to emergencies, to promote health and share health information in the communities where they serve. And in fact, there is a lovely article in the June edition of the Worldview magazine about some of this history that some of you may have seen, and if not, check it out. This 50 years of history is filled with stories and examples of Peace Corps volunteers using where there is no doctor to self-diagnose and treat everything from those minor everyday ailments to major health issues, to respond to emergencies, including more delivering more than a few babies, and most importantly, to help Peace Corps volunteers build the capacity of the people they work with to be able to take care of health, of the health of their communities. And we're looking forward to sharing a few of those stories today. Part of how Where There Is No Doctor first reached Peace Corps volunteers 50 years ago was that an amazing woman, Dr. Davida Cody, was acting medical director of the Peace Corps at the time. Her role was to make sure that Peace Corps volunteers stayed healthy and received health care, and also to evaluate health projects that the Peace Corps would undertake and support. Davida was a big fan of Where There Is No Doctor. And in fact, a few years later, was also the person who gave me my first copy of Where There Is No Doctor as I was heading out to Central America. And years after that, eventually joined and became the chair of Hesperian's board of directors. So during the 70s and into the 1980s, almost all Peace Corps volunteers received Where There Is No Doctor before heading out to their country of service. And since then, many health-focused Peace Corps volunteers received Where There Is No Doctor and has other Hesperian books during trainings. Many country directors have made sure that volunteers who were in a position to do health education work in their projects, whether they were teachers or agronomists or doing a women's economic empowerment promotion project or involved in a health project, ensuring that they had copies of the books. And Peace Corps always provides copies of Hesperian's books to volunteers who request them. And here I want to acknowledge with appreciation a special project between the NorCal RPCV group and Hesperian, which we ran from 2016 up until the pandemic. 
where we provided copies of his bearing books to all PCBs from Northern California as they were departing for their host country and to ensure that new volunteers were equipped to promote health in their communities of service. And Peace Corps volunteers have also been involved in helping us develop and test new materials. For example, volunteers working in Central Africa helped us test and field, te field test draft materials of helping children who are deaf. And volunteers serving in Central America helped us field test our community guide to environmental health a few years later. This longstanding partnership with Peace Corps was recognized and formalized with the signing of an official memorandum of understanding in 2014 between Hesperian and Peace Corps, recognizing the many ways that our materials, print, online, apps, and in multiple languages support Peace Corps volunteers and their host communities. This MOU facilitates our communication and coordination across the rather vast Peace Corps structure. As volunteers are beginning to return to service post pandemic, we're really excited to be able to reactivate and continue this support. Great, thank you, Sarah. Well, we are next going to follow up with a video from some RPCVs who served in the Dominican Republic, Ghana, and Cambodia. I worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic. For two years, I often used Donde No Hay Doctor, or Where There Is No Doctor, and Aprendiendo a Promover La Salud, or Helping Health Workers Learn, as resources to develop and train health promoters in my town, El Limón de Jimani, of about 3,000 people. I used graphics in the books to inspire didactic materials, and both books gave me great ideas about what a health promoter should be and how they can be selected, trained, and supported. In my third year, I worked to replicate the same model in three communities in the region. The group of seven women in El Limón who graduated as health promoters remained very active in their community, and they wanted to continue teaching other women about important health matters, such as nutrition and reproductive health. They had the idea to open an office and use the books as resources, since they were so useful to me. Sarah, RPCV, Dominican Republic. I was a volunteer in Ghana from 1988 to 1991. Initially, I started out as a water and sanitation volunteer, but it soon became apparent that the real need was for trained primary health care workers in the village. My wife and I started working at and eventually ran a clinic focused on guinea worm eradication. With a line out the door of 50 to 100 people every day, people waited to be diagnosed for health related issues. There was simply no access to good health care services and where there's no doctor turned out to be an invaluable source of information for diagnosing illness. As a result of the clinics, two villages approached me to train people in their area as primary healthcare workers. We started out with about 20 students and ended up with three students in two villages. When a group of Peace Corps volunteers left for the US, they left their copies of the book for me and I was additionally able to get books in the hands of all my students, the original 20. After two years of training, two days a week, two hours a day, all of the remaining students passed their tests at the district offices and were given their certificate by the Ministry of Health. In the end, both villages decided to build clinics, and one of them is still funded and run by the Ministry of Health. Having those students on hand with their copy of Where There's No Doctor was the impetus for real change in healthcare in the village and surrounding areas. I especially appreciate the emphasis in the book on taking an entire regime of antibiotics. This was essential to convincing one of my students, a medicine seller, to require his patients to buy and take an entire regime of drugs rather than the usual handful of pills. Moving through the diagnostic hierarchies in the book allowed my students to be logical in their approach to evaluating illness and subsequent treatment. Where There's No Doctor helped change the minds and attitudes of my students about health in general and in the change that one person could affect on their own. I'm sure a lot of lives were saved and many people empowered as a result of that text. Talbert, RPCV Ghana. I was a Community Health Education Peace Corps volunteer in Cambodia and I helped village volunteers and health center staff to improve their health education sessions. When I first arrived in my village, I used Where There Is No Doctor and Helping Health Workers Learn, two books which I soon realized are published by Hesperian. 
I found out that Hesperian was writing Health Actions for Women, which I thought could help me with my girls' empowerment and health class I was teaching, and finding both very rewarding and challenging. Every day I met people who didn't understand why this class mattered, so I wanted to try new methods to get everyone, boys, girls, men and women, involved in women's health and empowerment. Since the book wasn't available yet, I contacted Hesperian hoping to be a part of the process and get a sneak peek. A few weeks later, I was reading the family planning chapter with my counterpart from a local NGO called the Women's Resource Center. We planned a session on basic family planning, types of birth control, and how to choose birth control. What surprised me most during the session was that the women all understood the main message. Family planning is about your choice and what you need. It's often difficult to get people to look beyond memorizing information, but that's exactly what this book did. At one point in the session, we wanted to teach the women how to use condoms. One woman protested and asked, why would I need to learn this? I'm married and I already use an implant. Before my counterpart could speak, the other women were telling her about how a condom could prevent STIs and how with this information, she could go back and teach the younger girls what they needed to know. Family planning was actually one of the topics least talked about in the villages, but after using Health Actions for Women, I saw how empowering it can be for a woman to understand that family planning is about choice and not just about having fewer children. Helen, RPCV, Cambodia. Great. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the stories from the RPCVs as well as uh, the slideshow, which kind of covered all the different contexts in which, uh, well, people have sent us photos of uh, themselves with the books. Next, we're going to share another video of uh, an RPCV and Hesperian friend, Zena Herman, who was unable to attend today, uh, but she wanted to share her story. Uh, so here we go. Hi, my name is Zena, and I am a current Peace Corps volunteer um, from Ghana in West Africa, and I served from 2003 to 2005. Um, I remember receiving my own copy of Where There Is No Doctor among a large stack of books that were given to me during my kind of orientation and training period. Um, and these resources were meant to be of help during my service. I was placed in a very rural village about an hour bus ride away from the nearest internet cafe, which, uh, you know, was more often closed and non-functioning than it was open and actually working. And mobile phones were just starting to become prevalent, but there were no smartphones and, um, you know, there was very spotty connection. So these books were really my main source of reliable and trusted information that I had access to. Um, I remember looking at Where There's No Doctor and uh, just immediately resonating with both the like accessibility of the health information that was presented and also uh, just how empowering the voice was. Um, it, I really felt motivated and inspired to use the information in my work. My main job as Peace Corps volunteer was doing environmental work and focusing on kind of sustainable agriculture practices, but I was also involved in a lot of other just kind of general community development projects. And I, one of the things that I really felt excited about doing was forming some kind of health promotion, um, health education clubs with uh, middle school age students in my village. And uh, Where There's No Doctor was really my main source of, of information for the kind of curriculum that I developed. Uh, there was just so much great content in there about hygiene, sanitation, nutrition, infectious diseases, um, and it was all presented in a way that, you know, really spoke to the reality of people's lives and um, wasn't wasn't shameful and uh, really made people feel like there were, you know, concrete steps that could be taken to improve their health. I also, of course, used Where There's No Doctor more informally, um, numerous other ways. Uh, I was a frequent consult regarding various 
health concerns of, you know, friends and neighbors in my village. Of course, I had no qualifications other than possession of this book for that role. Um, but I remember clearly uh, looking up a health concern that a neighbor of mine had about a um, chronic cough and um, and realizing that he, he, you know, he did in fact need to seek care for this. And sure enough, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and fortunately subsequently treated. Um, but, but that was such a value of this book was helping figure out when things were reassuring and, and could wait on versus like when to really, you know, seek care and get help. And this quality of where there's no doctor also served me very well personally during my own appendicitis in country and helped me to realize that I did in fact need to get on that very bumpy trotro and ride an hour to the nearest hospital. Um, so forever indebted to where there's no doctor for that. Yeah, doctor was just such a cornerstone of my Peace Corps experience and I'm awestruck when I think about how many people my one copy of the book served um, just in my time in country and, you know, thinking about that kind of compounded by all the other Peace Corps volunteers who used it and other Health Sparian Health Guide materials um, all around the world is just uh, very inspiring. Thank you. So now that we've shared a few uh, RPCV stories, we want to have one more woo clap where we ask how has Where There Is No Doctor helped you and your community? Okay, so we're, we're getting, okay, rural health worker. Um, as a new nurse, it was invaluable to help me provide care to patients in the small rural hospital where I was in charge. Um, gave the books away in various sites, once to a woman who delivered her own infant and read the book as her labor advanced. That is very wild and impressive. Uh, creating health education materials, um, being a, a Peace Corps staff nurse, printing up a recipe book <laughs> and called it Where There Is No McDonald's. Well, we, we appreciate that uh, inspiration. Um, explaining malnutrition, helping keep the community healthy. Uh, well, the, these are just wonderful. Um, and please, you know, continue posting in the chat if you didn't get a chance to post yet, and we'll we'll sh try to share those after. So next, we have a video of Tanya Litwin, our director of digital projects, speaking with Matt from the doctoral project about how he helped bring to life a Bambara edition of Where There Is No Doctor. Okay. I, I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali, West Africa, and Where There Is No Doctor was standard issue to all the volunteers. Um, we used it to keep ourselves healthy as a reference, but also for our projects in community health and to, to help villagers who would come to us with questions. You know, you're in Mali. You have yeah. this book. How did you get from there uh, to deciding? Hmm, I think there needs to be not a French edition, but a Bambara edition. Um, so I uh, had the good fortune to go back and visit my after I got married. I brought my wife back, and we visited Mali together, the village where I served, and you know toured around the country. Yeah, just the 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 thought came to me. I, I saw that there was a little bit more of a written materials available in Bambara than there were back in the day. It's, it's a language with a, a tremendous history in terms of oral history. And there was not a lot of written material um, or books. And I just thought, wow, it would be really amazing. I had thought for a long time, it would be amazing if I had this resource in the language that the people in my village actually spoke, because very few people spoke French. So I'd have to do the translation myself on the fly. and. I didn't always do it correctly and you know people didn't always understand what I was trying to tell them. I did at times feel like oh you know is this just me as sort of a a wealthy westerner coming in and you know telling you what you need um but I mean that was tempered by my faith in the material like I know it's been around for a long time and it's incredibly useful and people have found it valuable and and also you know talking to my team saying like is this something people want, need? And they were like, absolutely. 
oh, it would be so great if, and we knew Hesperian was headquartered in Berkeley and, um, you know, we live in the Bay, we lived in the Bay area. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could talk them into translating it into Bombra for us? And, uh, we had a meeting and I, I, I think I even naively showed up at the meeting with a, a checkbook thinking I could write you guys a check and, and you would just be on it. <laughs> and then you, you sort of disabused me of that notion, Tanya, and said, no, you, you would have to get some translators and, uh, you know. How, how did you find the translators? Um, what was yeah. the working with them? Well, finding the translators actually turned out to be pretty easy. The Peace Corps had just closed their operations in Mali. Unfortunately, there was um, some, there was a, a coup d'etat and um, some political instability and Peace Corps decided to leave the country. And so the language instructors were out of a job and looking for work. And I, I contacted them through, through the Peace Corps and asked them if they'd be interested in working on this with us. And they said they were really happy to do it. We st so I had a team of four, which was great. It was two men and two women. That was important to us too. All native speakers of the language, all spoke French well. They all spoke some English as well, which was helpful. Yeah, so we started from the French edition and we quickly discovered it was published in Senegal, I think in the 1980s. So we kind of worked to insert the new information. There was new medicines. I think there's new guidelines about how to treat different diseases. There are new diseases that didn't exist then. So we got the English and then we translated that into French first so that we could send it to our translators in French. Just to call out a little bit of what you did with Bambara is oftentimes you need to go through a gateway language because there's not enough translators. So everything had to be translated into French, colonial power to get to the language of Bambara. That's very common where people need to go through another language to get to another language, whether it's Russian, English, yeah. Spanish, you know, like we produce English and Spanish, so it's a leg up, but there's a of all of our books, but there's a lot of folks that don't get to languages like Bambara. And we had an amazing group of volunteers. Um, we had an illustrator who helped um, adapt some of the illustrations to make them look more African. The illustrations, I think, are so such an important part of where there is no doctor, right? It's so visual. Um, and it's even better when they're adapted to the communities where they're yeah. going to, where the book's going to be used. We got a lot of support from the Return to Peace Corps volunteer community. And we would send it all just via email to, to our team in Mali, and they'd work on it really intensively. They would get together in person, the four of them, and they would debate and discuss the best way to translate things. And then, and then they'd send us back a draft. You and your staff recommended uh, field testing. And so we did do a bit of field testing as well. Um, I had a, a, a friend that was an anthropologist, also a former returned Peace Corps volunteer who was an anthropologist. And he was doing field work in Mali. And I said, hey, can you bring over some draft chapters of the book and show them to the people in the communities? So he did that and gave us a bit of feedback. That was, that was great. And then, and then also I, I flew to Bamako, the capital of Mali, and had uh, our, tra our translators really helped a lot. We invited uh, different uh, non-governmental non organizations and nonprofits that work in Mali to come. And we had a, like a three-day long workshop where we would sit and read the materials and they would give us feedback. And I got a lot of really good feedback that way as well. Most of our translations take place with partner organizations in the country, right? So, yeah, yeah. so mostly we work with people that have a need for the book, maybe right. because we're training health workers or training community health workers. This is a hugely underfunded part of Hesperian which is right. you, you felt also, um, but there's, um, those people are like, we need this in my language. You know, you've seen and our then, website and now how I have like the multilingual with where it's like French and Bambara and English all side by side. Um, that actually has become kind of a major resource in the like machine learning and translation community. Mm -hmm. Because it's the largest corpus of multilingual text for Bambra, I think, outside of maybe the Quran or the Bible or a couple of religious works, because it's this just this huge 600 page book. And so we worked with um, 
this Malian NGO that was doing a project in collaboration with some American universities to do uh, machine translation, mm -hmm. like, uh, like the equivalent of Google Translate for for African languages. So I, that was kind of a neat, um, you know, it didn't cost us anything, and it helped make you know language and learning accessible to more people. So I thought that was neat. Shortly after this project with this nonprofit. Um, Google came out with their own version of Bombra translation, which shocked everyone. Nobody knew it was coming. And mm -hmm. it's it's okay. It's not great. Yeah. But I've, I've used it. If you go into Google Translate and you ask it to translate some uh, drug name, um, the word that it'll spit out is the words that we invented. Because we had to invent a lot of words that did not exist in Bombra for like, and specifically for med medicines. We, and we just transliterated them, I think is the correct word, where mm -hmm. we sort of took the pronunciation, bombericized the pronunciation, and then wrote it according to the phonetic system of, of the language. Health Actions for Women is one of our newer titles. Mm -hmm. And one of our translators was a young man who's also a designer. And okay. he came back and said, I know so much about the problems of women in my country now. And, and, oh. and I'm so educated and like, I don't know how to tell people about this. It's like so important. And I was just, just give them the book. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, priceless. Uh, I loved, loved, loved the country, the people, um, the, the village where I lived, I had amazing friends and they were so warm and welcoming. And I think maybe that's what contributed to, uh, you know, me wanting to still do something. You know, it's so many return volunteers end up starting their own NGOs or doing projects or contributing to organizations. Um, there's a really strong, like, continued link to the host country, even, you know, years, decades later. I would absolutely encourage people to donate and support the organization. If, if someone called me up and said, hey, I'm thinking about starting a translation project, I, I, I would tell them it's been rewarding and fulfilling, but my God, it was more expensive and took way more time than we ever thought. So, uh, but yeah, I would definitely, um, you know, encourage volunteers if they're going back to visit, you know, buy some copies of your books and bring them with them and distribute them to health organizations and the, that are working, you know, in the communities. Great. Um, so we actually, we have Tanya here live today and we're going to ask her a few questions, but first I wanted to call out a few of the other, um, ways that people have used where there is no doctor just from the chat in case people didn't see it. So um, Lauren Goodsmith said, uh, as an Associate Peace Corps volunteer in communications in Mauritania, she worked with the Family Health Media Project uh, along with World Vision and assisted in preparation of videos, slideshows, and printed materials in the country's local languages preparing different versions for those various community members. So including maternal health, sanitation, hygiene practices, prevention of diarrheal disease and STIs and where there is no doctor was an essential reference. So thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. Um, and uh, let's see, Scott, says uh, he used it as a health educator in Fiji um, in multiple villages and with helping health, also used helping health workers learn uh, to train community health workers, and then later used both books in a Somali refugee camp to train refugees as community health workers near the Ethiopian border in the early 1980s. Thank you for sharing those stories. Tanya, so we wanted to ask you a few follow-up questions. Um, related to your video with Matt. First one is besides hard copy books, uh, which I know is how a lot of um, Return Peace Corps volunteers used our materials. How are health workers using Hesperian materials today? Yeah, you know, um, about 10 years ago, we started releasing all of our books 
and many of the translations online in a mobile friendly format. So there's, you know, a free version out there now that people can have access to on their phones if they have a Wi-Fi connection. And that really opens up um, access for all the people that have an internet connection, which is more and more people have a smartphone and either some data or they have Wi-Fi when they go into town and they're near something. And especially for, for taboo topics, they're more likely to look online and search for that. So I think that that's really important. And then we also have uh, our mobile apps and we're working right now on a major update to the Safe Pregnancy and Birth app. And we have the family planning app. Um, and so all, all of those are something that you can have download. And once they're downloaded, they work completely offline. And so for people that are, you know, go to town, download an app, and then it doesn't need to be online. And both of those things sort of expand um, access. Yeah, I think that that is another way that volunteers and people in country are using Hesperian resources. Great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I know you and Matt talked a little bit about adapting illustrations to local contexts and how valuable people find that. Um, I was wondering, besides illustrations, what are some other ways our books are adapted to local contexts? We have many, many editions of people who have translated and changed the illustrations. So that that's a very common thing. Um, it gives the look and feel where people find it more approachable. But we also have content adaptations and we encourage that so that it both work for people in their country. And a couple of examples of that one is, you know, in the Community Guide to Environmental Health, we have a air pollution section but our Mongolian translation partner really felt like they needed to have something more than we had and really added on to that. Um, I think, and they actually uh, are recently are releasing the Worker's Guide to Health and Safety, one of our newest, newest books. And they um, were fundraising to add a section on horseback injuries because um, a lot of Young people work in their livelihood on horseback and there's a high level of injury in it. Um, and they didn't end up getting the funding, but they're working on, uh, maybe it'll happen in a future update. And then I think, you know, people often add herbal remedies, local, local things to make it, to make it uh, resonate with their, what, they have available in their community. So I think those are the main kinds of adaptations, I would say. Um, and of course, the cover of books. Um, sometimes there's very beautiful covers. That's wonderful. Um, and very interesting about um, horseback injuries in Mongolia in the course of working. Okay. And so what other translation? So I know you work with partners, uh, the timelines can be very long, as Matt alluded to, but what other translation works are in various states of progress right now? Right now, we just recently got news that the Dari edition of Workers' Guide to Health and Safety was released for Afghanistan. We have amazing partners that when everything is in crisis, what do you do? You sit down and translate Hesperian books. We also, um, the Mongolian Workers' Guide to Health and Safety is getting printed right now. So that's coming out in a moment. Um, and we have new things starting in Hindi and in Zulu. And they're brand new translations that are started. You know, they're, the groups are just forming. And the Zulu actually is a, the addition of Disabled Village Children, which was translated in the 80s. And the person that did that when we emailed with an update did a really great thing. And I think she wanted to share this with other nonprofits and see if they could take up the mantle of updating this book and keeping it in print locally. And 
immediately people responded. And so we have a new set of people um, that are younger, interested in taking on this translation and keeping this book up to date. So that's really exciting. Um, it's just, just getting started. So there's nothing to report yet, but uh, and these are long projects, like Samantha was saying, but it is, it's just getting, getting moving and it. It feels like a changing of the guard where somebody that's been in the work of disability for many, many, many years is now enrolling other younger folks and nonprofits that are being led in that, that sector. Thank you, Tanya. Um, yeah, that is great. And I know one thing we've talked about a little bit uh, before is just how in the past, if you printed a translation, you know, those those books might be floating around out there, uh, but they could be out of date and they could be hard for some people to get access to. And so I know being able to put so many of the translations on the health wiki means that just so many more people can access them than in the past. Um yeah, it's the health wiki is now in 44 languages and there's, you know, the PDFs are also up in 50 languages. So I think as we start to get more and more languages digitally available and more and more people have smartphones to have access, those two things will come together and we can have a much wider reach in terms of health education, I think. I also wanted to follow up on something that Matt said earlier, which is out of the digital realm, back to the hard copy books. Um, I just wanted to make a plug uh, to everyone here that the next time you are traveling back to your host country, if you or any other RPCVs you know will be traveling soon, please reach out to us and we can offer you a discount on any books that you want to purchase to bring back with you to share with uh, the communities there. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And for our next section, I'm going to hand it off to Sarah for her conversation with Mary and Haley Beal. Hi. <laughs> well, it really is a pleasure. Um, this next interview is with Mary and Haley Beal, Return Peace Corps volunteer from Ethiopia. Um, we're delighted to have her speak because she has truly been an advocate of our work alongside of the Return Peace Corps volunteers at group from Eritrea, Ethiopia. And um, welcome, Mariam. And my first question really for Mariam is this, uh, could you share some highlights about your time serving as a Peace Corps volunteer? Where were you stationed and what was your main focus? And tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, I was in Ethiopia. I went there with the one of the largest groups of Peace Corps volunteers ever. There was about 275 volunteers uh, that arrived in Ethiopia all at once. All of them were for uh, were teachers, and uh, teachers uh, primarily in the secondary uh, level. For myself, I was a mathematics teacher, and uh, was uh, stationed in a uh, a town called Deborahan, which was about eighty miles north of the capital, so we got a little chance to go back and forth there. There were, there were in my group, just in Deborah Berhan, there were 12 people and uh, 12 volunteers. I taught uh, three uh, math uh, sections in the 10th grade. All, uh, all of these classes were 40 students at least. Uh, and then I also uh, taught uh, eighth graders. That was a little different. The eighth graders, their English wasn't as, wasn't as good, so I don't know <laughs> how well they would do. Uh, but I actually have a, a health story to tell you about Ethiopia. One, one of the students in uh, my uh, the eighth grade section, uh, he just terrific. He was incredibly smart. And uh, one of the Ethiopians who really latched on to Peace Corps volunteers. Then one day, after, you know, several months, uh, he didn't come to class. And then a couple of uh, days uh, after that, he, he didn't come. 
asked the other students, uh, well, what, you know, what has happened to uh, Brahano? And, uh, oh, he is sickness. So I asked, uh, well, you know, maybe I'll go and visit and see, you know, if I can help him. And for both Peace Corps volunteers at the very beginning, but every uh, volunteer got their own medical kit, which had the amateur medical products that you would have in your uh, medicine cabinet. I took that with, yes, he was very sick. Uh, so I gave him some aspirin and uh, wished him well. And then a the day or so later, he was back at school and he was fine and everything else. Shortly thereafter, a knock came at my door. I went to the door, and there was a a man there, who a young man, and he had a little girl with him. And it turned out that the young man was actually the brother of the boy who had been sick. We talked a little, and he was so, so just so thankful for... Uh, me to have come and helped his brother and so on. And then he actually wanted me as a thank you gift, he wanted me wanted to give me his little girl. And I <laughs> I immediately knew that that was not going to be the case. <laughs> and so and it turned out uh, I think my uh, our Cook helped translate uh, for me with the uh, gentleman, uh, but I had I I think I convinced them that the, his little daughter would be much better off uh, back in her own family and growing up uh, with them and so on. But I think of that with where there is no doctor, because there was no doctor and there was no doctor book <laughs> because you weren't in the business. Uh, uh, as uh, that at that point said, our group was very large, and Haile Selassie, Emperor Haile Selassie, who many of you might know that name, the Peace Corps when they were first getting going, they sent out people to uh, reach all the, all the uh, countries that they could and try to get them to take take on uh, Peace Corps volunteers. Well, it turned out that Haile Selassie totally embraced Peace Corps. He was the one that made it possible for us to double the number of teachers in the country when we arrived. He had a reception for us at the palace. He shook the hand of every volunteer there, being welcomed by the emperor uh, we knew that it was going to be a, a, a great, uh, a great thing to go. Yeah. Wow, Marion. And the very first cohort to go to Ethiopia, too. That's, that's really something. And as you mentioned, that was actually long before where there is no doctor was born. So can you, how did you first come to know about Hesperian? After I came home and, um, settled down and, started a family and so on. Uh, I ended up getting involved with the um, National Peace Corps Association. And uh, f a friend of mine, uh, he said, you want to start a group? So I started a group. And, uh, <laughs> and that was in, uh, let's see, I actually wrote it down. In 1991, uh, we have, and there's a particularly large group of returned volunteers. I went, to, I went uh, once to a, con a conference, an NPCA conference that was for nationwide, but all of the Ethiopian volunteers all clustered together. And among other people that I met was the gallery who is, has been the ultimate uh, volunteer for Hesperia. And she told me all about it and everything else. Well, I just, I couldn't believe how, it, what a great project it was. And I started 
myself uh, donating to uh, Hesperian and uh, I, I was the president because nobody else was willing to take it on. The bigger it got, the, the group got much larger. And one of the things that we uh, instigated was uh, what we dubbed the legacy project, which was basically a way to give, keep, keep our, keep giving back to our friends in Ethiopia. What the way this project was set up was individual volunteers would have, have a project that they wanted. There was people that were helping and giving money for garden tools and all of those kinds of things. And so after having been fallen under the spell of Lee and Hesperian, if the Ethiopians request a book, our money pays for that. It's been going since 2001. It just, it's just the perfect uh, way to have a system that is, all you have to do is send your money. And somebody else out there is pulling out the books <laughs> and sending them and all, all of that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I frequently think about, Ethiopia is a huge country and there are, are villages everywhere. I actually just this morning, I uh, looked up how many uh, doctors there are in the United States per 100,000 versus how many doctors there are in Ethiopia per 100,000. There's 301 doctors per 100,000 in the United States. 2.5 in Ethiopia. 2.5 doctors in the entire per uh, 100,000 for a huge country that has, you know, needs a lot more. And it's, you know, among other things, Ethiopia is on the low end of how other countries uh, compare as far as having doctors and so on. Uh, so I just I just love the project, and that, that it's going to go on forever for me. Oh well, thank you. You know, I, you're making a really good point about the fact that dis rural communities. I mean, because those two doctors per hundred thousand in Ethiopia are definitely in the cities. Yeah. So you know, rural communities are still you know, desperately needing health care. Um, one of the things that Ethiopia has been doing in recent years is actually training up a core of health extension workers, which is helpful, but those health extension workers have to be trained. And so, you know, we're really pleased to be part of that process also of, of, of sort of building the capacity of health extension workers NGOs that do that work, sending books directly to them, like we do through the wonderfully supported gratis book program that you've helped us do. And actually, more recently, also, um, the Ministry of Health, uh, with some partners in Ethiopia, we created the an Amharic and an Afan Oromo version of our family planning app, which they are now training health extension workers to use. Mm -hmm. so that they can deliver family planning information and contraception information. So it's it's part of an evolving process, but it you know, you've just highlighted some of the need that just still exists and I'm and we're so grateful for your support. I wonder if you'd be uh, willing to share what motivates you to be a long-term supporter of our work if there's anything else you'd like to add. I just well, as I said to an Ethiopian friend here in Oakland uh, about a week ago, Ethiopia is my other country. I, it's my other home. And I think of it and I, I, I think this is a wonderful charity that you have done wonderful things with. Yeah. Well, we're so grateful. Thank you so much, Marion. My pleasure. Really, really appreciate it. And 
Before we move on to the next segment, I just want to stop for a minute and pause because no celebration of returned Peace Corps volunteers and Hesperian would be complete without a special recognition of Lee Gallery. Um, as you heard from Marion, Lee was instrumental in introducing her and so many other returned Peace Corps volunteers to Hesperian. Many volunteers know where there is no doctor, yet very few know Hesperian and what we do. And so Lee has just been an ambassador and an advocate for more than two decades um, about Hesperian's work. And Lee served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia in the 60s also. And after retiring from her career in City College in San Francisco, Lee started a new career as a volunteer running Hesperian's Gratis Book Program, a program where, as we've heard from Marion, um, Hesperian sends free books to people who will share that information with others in their communities and who cannot afford the cost of the book or the shipping. So Lee reads each request we receive and using her wisdom and her intuition evaluates evaluates each of those requests to determine who will make the most use of each book that is sent out. So during the past 20 years, Lee has been responsible for Hesperian having sent over 30,000 books to people who in turn have shared that life-saving information with other community members. We know that each of these books is shared with at least 60 people. So Lee, your volunteer efforts with Hesperian have impacted over 1,800,000 people. So I just want to thank Lee on behalf of not just Hesperian staff, but all of those 1,800,000 people whose lives are better because of your work. So Lee, a total shout out to you. <laughs> and we have a short video uh, taken a few years ago of Lee talking about the gratis book program that we'd like to share with you now. Well, when I graduated from college in 1964, um, I joined the Peace Corps and went to Ethiopia for two years, where I taught English in Prince McCullen Haile Selassie Secondary School. And uh, when I came back, I got involved in civil rights and women's issues and things like that. Worked for the university for almost 25 years. A friend of mine introduced me to Asperian several years before I retired, and I donated for several years. One thing led to another, and I said I had some free time. So I uh, started volunteering with the Gratis Book Program. I've been doing it ever since. So my experience in Ethiopia helped me to really appreciate the value of Hesperian books to poor countries, even though these books were not written uh, when I was in the Peace Corps, but now every Peace Corps volunteer is aware of them and values them greatly. Well, we have a very small fund that is um, donor supported. Um, which allows me to get to send a certain number of books per month to rural areas uh, and some cities all over the world where people have heard about our books, need them desperately, but can't afford to purchase them. And so they write me letters and now recently send me emails. Uh, sometimes one person in the village has a, a cell phone and um, they even send me text messages from a cell phone um, asking me for free books. And uh, because our fund is so small, I, I have to have some you know, very tight criteria. Um, people who are in, directly involved with the health of women and children get first priority community-based health workers, uh, teachers, um, community development workers, and I even get uh, requests from veterinarian assistants who um, take care of the animals in the area, but since they sometimes are the only educated people in the area, the people come to them with their human problems as well. Um, so I send them some health care books. I have attended other seminars in the past, however, this is the first time I have received a gift of such importance. 
How many times have we walked hours to the nearest health center? Only to find it closed or without a doctor or medicine? In the past we have had to turn to medicine men, not knowing whether or not his treatment would be for the better or worse. Now we have begun the mission of prevention and being prepared. No one can take from us what we have learned in these past three days. It is now up to us to organize the community and make them aware of our knowledge. I would like to thank you for giving us the knowledge. Hello, my name is Karen Sokol, and I'd like to read to you my essay that I wrote about my Peace Corps experience in Ecuador from 1978 to 1980. And my essay is entitled, Where There Is No Doctor, My Guiding Light. In 1978, during my orientation as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Home and Community Development Program in Ecuador, we were given one key resource to guide our work donde no hay doctor, where there is no doctor. This book became my guiding light during my two years of Peace Corps service and in my later work as a health professional over the past four decades. When I arrived in my small rural subtropical Ecuadorian community, I had just graduated from college with a degree in biology on the pre-med track with a lot to learn about the world. I spent the first three to six months getting to know the community and their resources and needs and improving my Spanish. Donde no hay doctor was critical for both. Every night after the sun set, everyone else in the village went to sleep because there were no electric lights and they had to wake up before dawn to work in the fields. I stayed up poring over each chapter of Donde no hay doctor by candlelight. Based on what I learned from the first chapter for community health workers, I mapped out a daily plan to get to know the community leaders, the mayor, teachers, health professionals, store owners, and religious leaders, as well as all of the community members by going door to door and spending time with them, tomando un cafecito y charlando. Through these chats over coffee, I conducted a community needs assessment asking people about their daily lives, the number of people in their family, their education, how they supported their families, the local resources that were helpful for them, their major challenges, and their ideas about what we could work on together. I met all 350 people in the community, and I also got to know an elementary school teacher, Yolanda, who welcomed me into her family, helped me understand the community, and became my guide and partner in all of our community activities. To this day, 45 years later, Yolanda remains one of my greatest friends and teachers. Our community was low income with most families living from subsistence farming. Families typically had eight to 10 children and mothers recounted their number of living and dead children. Many families had experienced disability and death of children from injuries and infectious diseases. The older generation had not had access to vaccines, family planning, or information on first aid, but these services were available in the 1970s, and younger families were eager for opportunities to improve their knowledge and health. Again, following the advice in Donde No Hay Doctor, I let the community tell me what activities they wanted to do together. Based on the community's requests, we started a women's club that met monthly to discuss their family's needs and receive presentations from local experts from the Ministry of Health and Agriculture on family planning, cooking, and planting and tending home gardens. With support from nonprofit organizations, we started an elementary school garden and school lunch program, a clothing assistance program, and a literacy program for adults to learn to read and write. They also requested that I teach nutrition and first aid in the elementary school, and Donde No Hay Doctor provided me with the clear information, drawings, and ideas needed for engaging interactive activities for our sessions. I wanted to show you a couple pictures of me working in Ecuador in 1978 to 80. Let's see, there we go. 
On the top is a photo of me with some of the children. And on the bottom, uh, me with the children in our school garden. Over the past 35 years as a physician and professor of medicine and public health, I have worked extensively in community health and maternal child health throughout Latin America and Asia. Many of the Hesperian Press resources, where there is no doctor, where there is no dentist, and helping health workers learn have been invaluable for my work, and I have gifted many copies of these resources to my local partners. In preparing to write this essay, I pulled my well-worn copy of Where There Is No Doctor off my bookshelf to review it. So you might copy. After flipping through the familiar health topics and drawings, I returned to the introduction and I was awestruck by rereading the basic principles. One, healthcare is not only everyone's right, but everyone's responsibility. Two, informed self care should be the main goal of any health program or activity. Three, Ordinary people provided with clear, simple instructions can prevent and treat most common health problems in their own homes earlier, cheaper, and often better than can doctors. Four, medical knowledge should not be the guarded secret of a select few, but should be freely shared by everyone. Five, people with little formal education can be trusted as much as those with a lot, and they are just as smart. And six, basic health care should not be delivered, but encouraged. I now realize how fully I internalize the core values of where there is no doctor, and how I've spent my entire career working to demonstrate these values and teach these values to my students. I feel immense gratitude to Hesperian Press and Where There Is No Doctor for having been my guiding light for the past 45 years and for my work in the future. Thank you again very much. I know we're running long and I appreciate that so many of you have stayed with us. <laughs> so thank you. We just had so many stories that we wanted to share with everyone. As a final thing, I just wanted to share um, my story of how I got to know Hesperian. So I only became familiar with Hesperian about four years ago, but uh, I have been all in since then. And uh, one of the reasons is because Hesperian is an organization that really walks their talk. Um, I think the staff are incredibly smart and hardworking and they're doing so much good in the world. But the way they approach their work is by constantly centering the needs of the people they're serving and the partners they're working with. And they really always let those needs drive the current work rather than imposing what they think is right or what they think people should be learning about. And that's something that I value so much about um, Hesperian's work. So while we primarily wanted to gather everyone here today to celebrate the long relationship between Hesperian and the Peace Corps, while we're here, we'd also like to ask for your support. In terms of current projects, we talked a fair bit today about Hesperian's translation program, which provides small grants to folks undertaking a local edition of Where There Is No Doctor or some other book, um, and allows Hesperian staff to help them with technical support as well as help them figure out how to work with printers and illustrators. Your support helps fund the translation team to do all these things while also continuing to make sure where there is no doctor is up to date for the next generation of Peace Corps volunteers. And finally, I, we have the good fortune of announcing this evening a match of $5,000. Uh, this match has been put together by a few RPCVs plus the Ethiopian and Eritrean Return Peace Corps Volunteer Group, 
along with Hesperian board members. Uh, what this means in practical terms is that any gift from an RPCV or someone you refer to us between now and October 31st, end of October, will be matched up to $5,000. If you are able to make a gift today, um, you can send a check or log on to Hesperian's donation webpage. There on the honoree line, uh, if we have a code RPCV50. Uh, that'll let us know that you're contributing as part of the match. If you have any follow-up questions based on the program today, uh, please feel free to email uh, Kazia Sullivan. We'll also, I also wanted to thank everyone who participated in our RPCV story contest that's been running for the past few months. You guys have probably all received emails about it. We have four people um, receiving full uh, Hesperian gift sets to send to a community of their choice. So that is Benjamin Bellows, Karen Sokol Gutierrez, Divya Selva Kumar, and Lauren Goodsmith. So very exciting. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we are going to send out the recording of the event after this um, in case you missed any part of it or you want to rewatch any uh, of the videos. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate all of your support. Thanks.